Um, welcome everyone also from me, you know, like indeed, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. The, the beauty of the online environment is that, that people can join us from all over the world. Um, my name is Lutz Martin. I'm welcoming you this morning uh, as part of the Africa section of the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics here at SOAS. Um, so I'm going to give a little presentation. I have a sort of a, a mock lecture prepared uh, to give you a sense of what, you know, what our teaching is like, what our contents are like. Um, and I also have a little bit of background on the program. I was just wondering, because we ran open day events also um, last term, and I think even either the, earlier this term. Um, so some of you may have, have already been at the source open day. So there's a little bit of overlap just on the program structure, uh, but, the, but the bulk of, of what I'm saying, I think is probably new. So, so I, I hope there's something for everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a moment. Um, and I'm at that stage, I'm not sure whether I can see people's um, uh, chat or people's hands. Um, if you have questions, if there's anything you want to clarify, just speak up. Um, and Rachel also kindly has agreed to, to shout out if there's anything um, anybody wants to raise. Let me um, share my screen. There we go. Good. This is, I hope, I hope you're in the right room. This is about African studies, and I'm talking particularly about the MA African studies. And you can, you know, in the question time also talk about different different options. But I have a bit of an overview here. Um, and the title of the presentation is Approaching Africa, which is grand, and I narrow it down quite a bit in a few slides, but but you can see hopefully where I'm going with that. Um, so first of all, welcome to the SOAS Virtual Open Day and indeed the School of Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics. Um, which where the Africa section is housed. Um, I have a bit of background on SOAS, the highlights of the institution, and that, that's the part where I said you may have seen that before, indeed you may be aware of it through other, other channels. Um, we have 100 years of scholarships focusing on Africa and Asia, which we just had, in, well, just in 2016, we had our centenary, so, so we are well established. Uh, we, we, are, uh, we teach over 30 languages, so that's a very heavy language bias and originally, but it was very language focused. We now grown quite a bit. We are strong in arts and humanities and social sciences, but the languages are still with us. Um, we have a national research library, one of five in the country, specifically related to Africa and Asia. It's a very international place. We have students and staff from over 130 countries, um, expertise in some of the world's key regions that, that you know, we, we continue saying that, that it really matters the areas we are interested in, we, we work, with, uh, work with academically. Um, and it's probably the highest concentration of scholars work on African topics pretty much, I, I dare say, in the world. I'm not sure if that's quite true. It's a hard to do this comparison. But there's lots of people working in Africa, not just in the Africa section where I'm based, and the languages and cultures, but across all of our departments. So in history, in music, in political sciences, in the, in, in the School of Arts, there will be people with specific Af African expertise. And that body together constitutes quite a, quite a substan substantive amount of people. Um, I can say a little bit more about this L SLCL, the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. This is where the MA African Studies is housed. So we focus on Africa, also the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and we also strong in linguistics. Uh, we teach six African languages, normally not every year. So our languages on the book are, are Amharic, Hausa, Somali, Swahili, Yoruba, and Zulu. Um, coming year, we are probably teaching um, Amharic, uh, we are probably <clears throat> doing so Somali, we're probably doing Swahili and Zulu. Uh, we are not quite sure at the moment about Hausa and Yoruba. <clears throat> but that's what, just for next year. In the long term, um, we want to maintain this fairly broad coverage. It is needless to say, I think it's the broadest coverage of African languages in the country, and it's pretty broad in international terms as well. Um, academically, we focus on African literatures, cultures, linguistics, and translation, and we collaborate and have links with lots of partners in Africa. Um, and also with the African diaspora, and have come back to that actually in a moment. Um, good. Um, this is the MA African Studies. You can do it full time or part time. This is just a summary. And, you know, if you have questions, also please email me um, if you want further information. We have two newish core modules remapping area studies and approaches to African studies, which we are very pleased about. Um, you all write a dissertation of 10,000 words, there are then six optional Africa focused modules. Um, one has to come from the arts and humanities, the other from the social sciences, <clears throat> because we are quite keen on the interdisciplinary nature of the program, because it has such a strong regional focus that allows you a lot of breadth in terms of the thematic approaches. Um, and at least one language model is recommended. We don't require that, but, but we do think, and I personally believe that 
that it really is helpful to speak the language of a particular society area region you, you study because it gives you so much better access to discourses on the ground. So, so language study for, for us, we think it's important. Um, here, a bunch of examples of modules. So you can see it's a wide range. We have politics uh, modules, and these are just illustrations. They don't necessarily run year on year. If you want to specifically know what's running next year, have a look at our website. That should be up to date. Uh, but these are uh, these are modules which have been running over the last couple of years, which are which are um, popular. So we have politics, we have feminism, we have music, um, we have modern contemporary arts in Africa, language identity society in Africa. I, that that's my module. I'm involved in that. Uh, African literature, uh, economy, philosophy, um, African Asian diaspora, and and law modules as well. Um, so there's quite a bit to choose from. Um, that is that summarizes the, the program. I'm happy to get back to this because I want to move on really to the more content heavy you know, part of today. Um, and this is this is approaching Africa. And the, so a lot of the images or the background images are from, from East Africa, really. That's the part of the world I work on. So I work on Swahili um, and other related languages. Um, and this is a, a, a view from the water side uh, of Zanzibar, Zanzibar Harbor, or the, you know, the harbor front. The, the old Foridani is called the old um, customs customs area. Um, and in a sense, I thought it's a nice metaphor for approaching because it has an element of you know, arriving somewhere by ship and then getting to know. So there's a, there's a physical sense, but of course here I'm talking about approaching more in the, um, in the intellectual sense. Um, I have here, um, uh, you know, talking points, if you like. These are, these are things which maybe you have thought about, which brought you here, which makes you think about studying Africa, engaging with Africa as a continent and, and you know, in a, in a physical sense, but also in intellectual sense, um, academically. Um, and I'm going to, to, to zoom in on some, and I'm, I'm, you, know, you might not be surprised at this stage. Um, I'm, I'm going to use language as my guiding point. So I have two case studies on language in a moment, but this is the wider scene, if you like. So these are, hmm. I think talking points is the, is the right, but it's propositions to which, you know, which may work as entry points maybe to engage with Africa academically. So one is diversity and unity. This is really important. There's, there's, you know, there's a lot of, lot of diversity across the continent, and it's really hard to say anything really meaningful about Africa. On the other hand, there is a sense of unity that you can say, you can talk about an African experience and indeed an African diasporic, diasporic experience. Um, so it's this interaction between being very diverse and very localized on the one that, but also having a sense of unity on the other. And, and in a sense, it is shared, you know, there's a shared unity across the global south, which we bring out quite a bit in, in the remapping area studies. And indeed, there's global unity as well. Um, the other, you know, if you like, dichotomy is, is sometimes Africa is called the home of humanities because in terms of, in terms of evolutionary studies, lots of people agree that, that the first, you know, our, our long, long, long time ancestor as, as, the, in, as humans, come from East Africa, from the old Dubai Gorge. So that's Tanzania, Kenya. I'm, I'm fond of that because that's the area I work in, but there's other, you know, there's South African, there's, there's Ethiopian um, um, evidence as well. Um, but, the, but, but certainly there's a very long, long history of, of human settlement and human culture in Africa. But on the other hand, it's also the continent of youth because the, the youth population is so strong in many, many African countries. If you look at the demographics, it's a very young continent compared to many other parts of the world. So again, we, you have this, you know, these things play with each other almost. Um, of course, colonial experience is really important. We have colonial legacies, um, but also a strong, strong discourse on decolonization. That is very strong at source. We are very keen in that and have, have been for a long time. Um, and that's something which will come very much also in the course content we talk about that. It, 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 it's a question of which authors do you read? Who has access to knowledge? Which which models of explanation are interesting. Um, and we, in a sense, we, you know, I, I think we step back a little bit because it's an academic approach. So we want to understand that as, 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 as you know, systems of knowledge say, and also then study the politics behind it, of course. There's a very, very lived experience associated with that as well. Um, then <clears throat> linked to that is maybe complexity and perspectivity. You, you know, the, these questions are complex, so they require complex thought, they require complex models to understand and engage with, and perspective plays roles. Are you, are you approaching African studies as an academic discipline from someone from the continent or someone from another part of the world with links to the continent? Are you approaching because you have 
personal relations, biographical relations, are you approaching it academically? I personally don't really have biographical relations. I, I, I started engaging with Africa fairly. I came partly through politics. It was, it, you can guess my age. Uh, it was the anti-apartheid movement when South Africa was still under the apartheid rule and we got engaged with that. Um, and in fact, on the right hand side, the middle picture, that's, that's uh, South Africa and the multilingual nature in South Africa. Um, and then I started learning Swahili. And so my approach to Africa was much more intellectual than a language based one. Um, and that, you know, that, that is, of course, that is all entirely legitimate, but it matters in terms of your own understanding. So it's important to reflect on that. Um, town and country is a big topic in, in Africa in many ways in terms, of, in terms of politics, of course, in terms of development discourses rural Africa versus urban Africa in terms of literature, that's a big trope. Um, center and margin, there's a long discussion to what extent Africa is the center and, and Europe is marginally rounded or whether Europe is the center. And of course, if you look at in the Chinese history, there's a clear sense that China is the history. People like to think of themselves as the center, but that's a really interesting discussion to be, be had. Um, and then the final thing I mentioned that was the global, glo glo global aspect of the global connections across the whole, the whole world, obviously. Um, and then particular diasporic connections across communities across the world, linking back to different parts of Africa. Um, on the right hand side, the bottom one, this is our, our language, our pride, that's it's a mobile phone advert from Tanzania, but you can see their link, the link between identity, nationhood, the, it's the national flag and language as well. Um, I think I'm taking longer than I should, so I'm moving on a little bit. I have two case studies. Um, <clears throat> one is the African language renaissance. So I, I said I'm going to move through language, but that's more, um, that's focusing on the continent. And, and then another is a small research project we did, we are still doing on COVID-19 amongst African communities in London. So we work with London, African, African language communities, and we, we, um, we investigated the use of language and the use of information more widely in understanding COVID-19 interactions with that. Um, uh, so I'm just checking that I can see the chat. It is the house and Yoruba. Will it come back? I, you know, Nigerian heritage. Yes, I'm quite aware. It's the two Nigerian languages, which it's just by accident, really, that they're not running. Yes, um, so certainly. I mean, we are pretty much looking, looking, bringing them back. Um, not the coming year, but the but the following year. Um, and we have certainly strength of our Hausa program, um, and we work on Yoruba as well. But yeah, I can say more about that. Um, a bit later on. Um, good, then let me go back to the case that the African language renaissance, the, um, what I'm after here is, this is, sorry, this is from Zambia. I've worked for a long time in Zambia. And this is again, mobile phone about, you know, celebrating the linguistic diversity in the country in English, ironically. So there's no ethnic language involved, um, but, but it is an acknowledgement of the linguistic complexity. Um, and what I like that because, because African languages have become more, positively seen, more popular, more visible in public discourse than maybe they were 30, 40 years ago. So that, that's a really interesting development. So the background is that African language has sustained and supported the cultural, social, and economic achievements of the continent for a very long time. Um, and then the study of language can help us to understand the history of the people and society speaking them. Um, and in the course of the history, African language has been associated with, for example, periods of expansion, established polities and political systems, and indeed with patterns of multilingualism. So I, I think in this context, I don't need to do that, but I want to counter public perceptions that African languages are somehow inferior or not, not able to create you know, thought or systems. This is all really wrong. So I'm, I, th I think we should start with that as the baseline. Um, this is the map. Maps are problematic and fascinating. Their own right, lots of stuff to be said about map. But this is, I, you know, I, I, I put in map here. The color coding gives you what is called different language families. Just again, going back to the question of complexity. Um, so there's lots of languages and lots of linguistic diversity involved, which is which is interesting, um, and you know, subject to lots of studies at the moment, also particularly in terms of multilingualism and what it means with, for the question of language and identity. Um, I, I won't dwell on it, but there's lots of questions we can ask also, even about the representation. And of course that the language is in German, but that's just because that's where I got the name from. Um, a, a little bit back on the history. This is, this is we are strong in Swahili, you, know, you, you may know that. So we have lots of holding of Swahili literature where we're working and have been working with the university in particular, Dar es Salaam for quite some while uh, to work on these manuscripts. You can see this is Swahili, but it's written in Arabic script. So there's a link also with the Arab world. Now Swahili is written in, in Roman script, so in, from, it's a colonial legacy. 
Um, but if you read Arabic, you can see there's little signs on top and the bottom of the line. So these are vocalized texts, really fascinating stuff. Not easy to read or understand because it's quite, quite old. There's lots of cultural references. Um, <clears throat> this is a very famous book. It's called The Souls Awaken al um, which is about cultural decline. But I'm just showing that because it sits in source library, so the manuscript in source library. So there's this the long literary tradition, and but also from us the, the study of that, which is important. Um, then the colonial background kicks in. So here we have marginalization, devaluation, and underdevelopment of African languages. Colonial governance on balance didn't look kindly at African languages. Rise of negative attitudes, the introduction of colonial languages, of course, English and French mainly, but also Spanish, Portuguese. A little bit of Italian, even, um, and then we can we can ask ourselves about. We just had Arabic, you know. We can ask ourselves what the status, the status of Arabic is in that context, um, and and Afrikaans, of course, is another interesting question. Um, but so we have this introduction. We have then political and colonial agendas, language ideologies, which often put European languages on top as the better civilization, thereby justifying the rule of of the social, the political, the economic rule of of the area. Um, language event, invention and what is called linguistic essentialism, reducing people to one language and fixing them in a particular social cultural position. Um, <clears throat> and then pedagogy and politics, education plays a huge role. What language do you teach and how do you use the money, manage the transition from the home language to the school language? <clears throat> and what are parents and, and students' own attitudes to language? Really fascinating angle as well. But there's lots of, if you can, you can see a colonial background. Um, and one example I have here is the, it's uh, going back to, to the anti-apartheid in South Africa. That's the Soweto uprising you're familiar with, I think, maybe in 1976, when school children demonstrated against the use of, use of Afrikaans in schools for English, interesting, not, not for Zulu or Isidnosa or, or Isindebele. Like there's big South African African languages, of course, but it was mainly the push for English against Afrikaans. Um, and it was a turning point in many ways um, for the end of apartheid, even then it took another you know, good, you know, almost like 20 years, but uh, but it was a real eye opener for the world at large. And I think many people in South Africa that there was something really wrong with the political system. Um, <clears throat> now, let me move to the, the Renaissance, the rebirth, if you like. Um, so during the colonial period, we said that African languages experienced marginalization, suppression, negative attitudes. Um, <clears throat> and after independence, many African countries adopted a one language policy often promoting English and French. If you look around the continent, if you draw on your experience, um, the, the early after independence, often English and French and other colonial languages, ex-colonial languages, I should say, uh, played, played quite a big role. But more recently in the 21st century, we've seen the onset of what I call an African language Renaissance. And of course, there's a whole other discourse about African Renaissance, which, you know, which is in a sense, it's a, it's a post-colonial term, but also Tabombeki revived it then and talked about you know, the African era, the, the time for African as Africa has come to really fulfill its potential. Um, and so the, the African language renounces as part of that whole school of thought. So there is a recognition of African language and public policy, a much, much higher status, development of multilingual policies in education, public discourse, African languages entering schools, and the birth of new varieties. This is really fascinating. Sheng in Kenya, you know, it's a mixture of Swahili and English, they say. Um, pidgin in Nigeria, translanguaging the use of many different languages in the same context. All these are sort of new developments which assert African languages more forcefully in, in the public domain. So if we look at language policies in the 21st century, I have a number of examples here. Um, South Africa, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, all we can, you know, I can say more in detail, but this is just really to give you an idea that across the continent, there has been a change in thinking. We have minority and endangered language activism, smaller communities in terms of the size of speakers are, are more, more active about promoting the languages. We have education and literacy programs. Then on the technology side, we have speech and language technology, natural language processing, translation, um, and then the African Academy for Languages, the uh, African Union Arm for Languages has been very active in that area as well. So there's lots of stuff happening on this sort of policy level. Um, this is a little example of Swahili. I took the slide from another presentation. It's bilingual in Swahili and, and English. And we've seen already the, the Lura Yetu example there. The middle picture is from, from, from Nairobi. It's um, Pata Chapa around the corner. It has Swahili, then Sheng, this new youth language and English 
old saying there's a cash machine around the corner. It's a, it's a, it's a Barclays ad. Um, <clears throat> the top one, the top right one, that's just bilingual signage. And on the, on the um, bottom right, it's, a, it's an annual conference of the Swahili Society of Kenya. And you can just see the academic weight behind that as well. That's in, in 2019, just before, before COVID hit. Um, it just gives a sense of the versatility of Swahili in East Africa and many different domains. Um, and this is just a little map of showing Swahili, teaching Swahili across the world. I think it is probably the wide, most widely um, taught African language. So we have, of course, lots of Swahili programs in the US. We have in Japan and China, uh, Swahili programs, lots of European universities and outside of university teach Swahili and also on the continent. So of course in East Africa, but also in South Africa, in Ghana, we have now Swahili being taught at university level. So there's a real sense that Swahili probably is the most international African language. Um, good. A brief youth language. This is really interesting as well. African urban youth languages are in-group language, and they are typically spoken by young people, although that varies quite a bit what we mean by that. Um, they are often characterized by innovation. They are, they, are, they are consciously changing word forms and structure. Um, they undermine and subvert standard varieties, and so can be seen as questioning social power relations through languages. Essentially, young people, I talked about the demographic Demographically, demographic strength of young people. This is one expression of the of the of the claim to political power. Um, and as I said at the last bullet point, it might it might be related to these demographics and also to the sense of relative disenfranchisement of these groups. And again, if you think of of African context, you are familiar with. You know, think about how much access to power young people have in terms of education, employment, political power, you know, and in particular economic politic power structures. So in that context, maybe then these youth languages also play, play, a, play a role. Uh, this is um, Kenya Sheng on the right-hand side, the book by Chekiki Thura, who was a colleague of ours, who has now moved back to Kenya. He worked on Sheng quite a bit, but we're still very much in close contact. Um, a radio station, the voice of uh, the voice, the official Sheng station, the, vo the voice of the youth. Um, we have um, African youth language in South Africa, Sepitori, Sozital, that's also probably a, a quite famous one, it's a well-established older one. Uh, Luyai in Uganda, Nuchi in Cote d'Ivoire, many others across the continent and which are being described and, and you know, more visible now in the last 10 years or so. Um, good, um, African English is, that's another interesting thing. We have colonial legacy, we've seen that global English-based whole education, but what is really interesting is the access to English. On the one hand, it's there's an elite formation element. So. English is accessible mainly to, to you know, education and social needs, but it's also seen as modern, sometimes seen as neutral. And then we have what I call here the appropriation of English. We have varieties in South African English, Nigerian English, and they become much more, much more positively associated with, with the speakers than they used to be in the past. So this is Chino Achebe, a heavyweight on in African literature um, um, from, from Ghana, who writes in 65, the price a world language must be prepared to pay is to submit to any kind of use. And then he says, the African writer should aim at fashioning English in as what English has to be owned by the African writer and become an African language, even though it remains a world language. So that's a really strong claim. And that is mirrored in 2020 by, um, by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. You, you've read her, I'm sure. This is Ed Soa, she's a Soa's honorary graduate, I think that's what it's called. Um, and she said in 2020, my English speaking is not, not, not British, not American, Australian, it's Nigerian. And she said, I've taken ownership of English. So there's a whole discourse of, of ownership and appropriation around English happening at the moment as well. And this is just an example of African English. We have Aish, the you know, South African, is it, is, it, is it English? The Pitchin, BBC Pitchin, there's now a, a website, you know, a news channel on, on the BBC in Pitchin. Um, and then right and just a colleague of ours uh, writing on, on Kenyan English. Um, good, so to, to bring that up, this is what I mean with the language renaissance. We have like the, the presence on the web, we have the literacy. I, I have Neville Alexander here because he was a great proponent of African languages who passed away as a, a language activist who was very, very keen on getting African languages out there. And in a sense, he passed away in 2012, but I think he would be happy to see the development even over the last 10 years in terms of, of public appeal. Good. Um, then my second case study is, and I, you know, yeah, I, I think it's just about half past. I'll do that quickly. This is now a project we've done here 
on COVID-19 with, I mean, the project is wider. We looked at, I think, around 15 languages or so, uh, but I'm focusing here on the three African languages in there, which was, um, uh, we looked at the, the Algerian community. Um, so that's Algerian Arabic. We looked at the Swahili community and the Somali community. Um, but but so this is, it's a UK, UK I funded that is, you know, it's, it's a UK United Kingdom research something. I don't even know what it stands for, but it's public one, it's government money effectively. Um, so we got a project to focus on 17 languages um, because speakers of community languages are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Um, and there's many reasons for that, but one reason might be information. Um, and then we focus particularly on London because London is, is extremely complex in terms of the linguistic diversity. So I have here some preliminary results from the focus groups on Somali, Swahili, and Algerian community. So for the Somali community, what came out when working with the community says that what is really important is that is family links. And there's a difference between how, how long people have been here and how much contact they have back to the family in terms of their understanding and reaction to COVID-19. Um, the other thing is, is affectedness of the UK. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was an overall feeling that COVID-19 hit the UK much more strongly than Somalia. And there were people to go back to Somalia uh, in order to avoid COVID-19. And this link between how affected is the UK and by extension maybe Europe and how affected is Africa and African countries, that was a really important theme running through all these conversations and people trying to make sense of it, what that means for themselves, for their community and, and which information to, to believe on, uh, to believe in. So, um, um, another thing which came from the Somali community, the GP, that general practitioner, that local doctor was seen as a reliable source of information. And that was not the case across all the communities we spoke to. So it was interesting that the Somali community, and it's, of course it's based on only a few interviews, but, you know, I, I think, I mean, so we had like researchers in each community. I think this is probably about 20. So it's not, not representative, it's qualitative research, but this was quite a strong feeling we got from, from the work we did. Um, um, Somali language information, which was provided by many councils, wasn't maybe as efficient as we would have thought. Many people didn't receive that information. And um, there's an issue of written versus spoken language. Many people would have preferred um, spoken language. And that's also where social media comes in. So that's the next bullet point. Lots of information comes to, to, uh, to WhatsApp in particular. And there, of course, you have voice, voice messages as well. Um, but it also may come to other social media channels where we have recordings, even videos. So it's away from the, from the written language. So this was really important as well, picking that up. Um, moving to the Swahili community, that's really interesting. If you, if you followed the Swahili po policy, the president of Swahili from 2015 to 2021 um, uh, was President Magufuli, and he was known as a COVID denier. He said COVID doesn't exist, it's all a hoax, certainly doesn't exist in Tanzania. There was no COVID policy at all, neither vaccination nor distancing in Tanzania. And until Magufuli himself passed away, chances are of COVID in 2021. And the new president, uh, Samia Hassan, that has changed now quite a bit. So she has joined, or under her leadership, Tanzania has joined COVAX, the International Vaccination Program. But, but so when we, um, conducted our research, Magufuli was still in power, and there was a real difficulty for the Tanzanian, particular Tanzanian community here in London, about this very strong anti-COVID rhetoric coming from Tanzania and their families back home. And the, and the, you know, the, the UK and wider European and you know, global um, um, news about COVID as a real serious risk and, and the local discourses here. And people were really caught between, on the one hand, you know, taking some from the Tanzania, not taking very serious in London, on the other hand, warning family and friends back home in Tanzania about, look, take it more seriously than what appears to be happening from your discourse. So there's a real international exchange. And again, social media was absolutely important. Um, also, we found that there was quite a bit of stigmatization, the avoidance language. People didn't want to talk about COVID-19. So there were, there were ways to talk around it. Ugonjwawa, Changa Motia Kupumua, the disease of breathing difficulties. Um, so, so also, also death, death reasons for death, but sometimes maybe not quite recorded in the way they would have been medically, precisely because of the stigma associated with it. Um, I, and that's, of course, again, we've seen that in lots of other communities, in, 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 including in, in both the North and the South. Um, social networks play a role. Uh, vaccine, that was interesting. We had lots of work on vaccines. 
uh, lots of people say I'll, I'll wait a bit longer. So there was also that that element. Um, there were herbal remedies. It was it, it was a brew, it, uh, a steam. You know, people put the pot and then used inhaled the steam made from lemons and other other herbs. So this was quite important. That that played a long role. There was a lot of discussion to what extent. To what extent it's dangerous because people people feel like this is really a cure. To what extent it's actually beneficial, or to what extent it's not really beneficial but it's quite harmless. So there was lots of discussion about this, but this really made the round in social media as well. Um, and then finally, moving on to the Algerian community, there was was quite a bit of distrust of official Algerian sources and Arabic more widely. There was a real sense, at least in the Algerian community members we work with, who said that the language of science is English. So I don't trust Algerian or Arabic information. That was really interesting because it also meant that NHS information, UK information in Arabic was seen as less reliable than almost the same information in English. So there's a real language attitude issue, a language ideology issue, which, which came up here. Um, informal networks that was now Nigerian Arabic and that changes it slightly. But then again, people said, you know, this is this is not, you know, this, you know, uh, this is not, it's not even modern standard Arabic, so it's not written. So I don't really rely on that for for accurate information about the disease. Um, <clears throat> whereas English was was seen as more positive, um, trusting the information in English, uh, trusting um, trusting the NHS. Um, <clears throat> so that came out quite quite strongly there as well. Um, and then the final thing, really, trust was really, really important. Um, and interesting, I said earlier, the Tanzanian the Somali community said GP was, an, was, a, was a person of trust and authority, if you like. The Algerian community didn't have that. They say, we're not sure about our GPs. Um, I, you know, I, I prefer, I prefer um, online information. Or indeed, I find it really difficult who to trust. So trust was a, was a big issue there as well. Good. Um, to conclude, the results and recommendation, different language communities have their own dynamics. And, and in a sense, health communication has to be has to be, take that into account. Um, also, what we found that health communication is a two-way street. It's about both providing information, but also understanding community discourses, what comes from the communities. Um, and then for, for information, dissemination of information, we found that choice of language is important. Register, also mode, is it written, spoken, signed? Um, and the choice of channel in terms of officially in, informal social media is important. The, the community leaders and authorities, people of authority played a big role as well. So it was fascinating, it's still going on. If you want to get engaged with that, we have, you know, we, with the team is still there, we continue working um, and we are still doing dissemination type thing. In fact, we had a meeting just yesterday, a sort of UK wide little conference. And we have another conference coming up actually at the end of April, I can send information about that. That, you know, it's a public conference. If you're interested in that sort of stuff, you're very, very welcome to come along to that. Um, with that, I'm done. I end with an aerial view of Nairobi, um, zooming back into East Africa. And I think I'm going to stop sharing um, my screen now. Um, and I'm happy to, to have some, um, some questions or indeed comments. And oh, there's Ida. I'm, I'm very pleased, Ida, that you can join us. Ida, that's quite all right. I, we've, I said that earlier, Ida, it's, we are very lucky to join. Ida is joining from other meetings and is, is, you know, has a busy schedule today. Uh, but Ida is a colleague, Ida Hajibanis is a colleague of mine in the Africa section um, who is in charge of our Swahili program. And actually, she's also the convener of the MA African Studies. So she knows the program better, better than I do. But I, you know, we, you know, you know we, we checked. I mean, the information I've given was correct. I'm, I'm fine with that. But she can speak to that as well. Um, very good. Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, on the chat, please do share the conference details. Thank you, Ida. I was just talking about the um, COVID, uh, our COVID project conference, which Nana is organizing in the end of April. Yes, I'll, I'll do that just now. I see, I see where I can find it now. Now, um, um, otherwise, Rachel, do we have a chance to send people information afterwards? Sorry, I nearly didn't unmute myself there. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, we can follow up with them. Um, and so that everyone knows as well, we will be sending some sort of further information uh, over the coming weeks. We do have another session, another live chat session. Um, this is on the 13th of April, and it's an opportunity if anyone has any queries more about the sort of 
application or the entry requirements, sort of that side of things. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, if anyone has any further questions now about the course or, or what Lutz was talking about, then you know please do. Um, but any sort of student recruitment questions, we can we can come back to those at that date. I just checked. I can't easily find find the conference details, I'm afraid. But yeah, Rachel, I'll pass them on to you once we have them. As you, if you can find them. Oh, of course, feel free to email me. I can put my my email um, address in the in the chat. Um, so that's all. You know, if you have other other questions on any of that stuff. But um, um, any other question? Anybody wants to say, speak, put something in the chat? Um, because also we have a little bit of a I'm I'm actually I'm really curious about what you make of this language language stuff. Um, ah, Stuart, will the slides be pre-circulated? I yeah, I'm happy to to put a PDF together. Yeah, we've also recorded this session as well. So oh, um, we will yeah. also be um sharing that as well, sharing mm -hmm. that as well, um, along with the information about the upcoming session as well and sort of a link to it as well. So yes, Stuart, um, all of that will be available in, in kind of the coming weeks and we'll share that by email with you. Uh, and then uh, there's, there's in, it's a, a chat from Ling Fung. Can BSc Social Sciences graduate apply to the course? Ida, do you want to speak to that? Yes, yeah, no, definitely, yes. I mean, you, it, it's like, I think if you have interest in Africa and um, if, if, if your grades sort of like uh, are uh, what we're looking for, then please do apply, especially, I mean, this is when you're going to be focusing on your niche, on the area of interest that you, you have. So social sciences and Africa, I think they, they, they match really well together. So Ling Feng Sham, please do apply, yes. I don't know what you think, Lord. Um, no, I quite, I quite agree. In fact, you know, I said earlier, but one, one of the beauty, I, I think, one of the beauties of doing a regional studies degree is that you are more at liberty on the discipline side. So, so this interdisciplinarity is really important for us. So, so I, yeah, I mean, I mean, social sciences graduates are certainly welcome, but, but I think on the one hand, you can strengthen your social sciences, but it also gives the chance then to, to dip a little bit in the arts and humanities and, and broaden your disciplinary base while having this really strong regional focus in Africa. Yeah. Uh, which allows you to do that, but as as an uh, from, as an uh, as an applicant, yes, absolutely welcome. Yes, um, and I think okay because we have the okay dissertation, which is a time that allows you to focus on on things that really interest you. You could probably bring in something from your um, okay bachelor's degree and 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 and, and focus it into Africa. Yes, definitely. Can I, can I just ask for in, in just you know in in your in your you know particular interest in particular African context like you know places you've been visited or you're interested in or languages you've learned or speaker interested in you know does does this stuff about the language renaissance does that does that resonate do you feel like like the youth stuff the strong youth demographic that in you know, a lot of public discourse is, is you know run by youth but there's also an element of access to political power um, and and that that's coming up also with social media. The other thing which is really interesting is of course the Arab Spring, which we had a few years ago, which was also really it was a very grassrooty type thing, a very social media type thing, um, and and runs through Arabic. Does is that something which resonates with your experiences? Uh, just, just type, type in the chat. I, you know, I don't want, want, want to particular um, put people on the spot, but it would just be, just be interesting. Um, in the meantime, also, Emily, yes, if you have questions, of course, uh, all, all, all welcome. Are there also opportunity to assist an ongoing research center of African studies? Yes, to gain experience research for a portion of ah, potential PhD student. Thank you for mentioning that. I happen to be in my other, not my other life, but another role I have. Um, I'm the head of our, our doctoral school. So I'm, you know, overseeing, if you like, our PhD community. So I'm very, very pleased to hear that, of course, that's the other, other you know, the trajectory of the masters. We haven't talked about that, but that's, you know, it's an, it's an interesting question. So the MA African Studies equips you, obviously, for all kinds of, of professional careers. 
linked in any and ever so many different ways to Africa. If you want to work on the continent, that's a good way. If you you know if you want to work here, but with African purpose, and lots of our graduates at, end up also you know maybe not working specifically with Africa, but it's just the skills they acquired during the MA. It's you know it's the analysis. It's the it's the really interdisciplinarity. It's the engagement with a particular dynamic continent, even if you then don't work in that context, that in itself is useful for employers. But there's also the academic route, which then prepares you for PhD study. Um, so that's certainly true. Um, and, and we encourage that. So a number of our, our master students do continue then to the PhD level. And, and for African studies, SOAS is a good place for, for PhD research. Um, and then also, thank you for mentioning the Center for African Studies. Yes, that's really important. So that's that in a sense, that's then, you know, it's space in the school where, where, where we all come together, because as I said earlier, lots of Africa experts sit in different departments, but the Center for Africa Studies brings that together and indeed also Africa, people interested in Africa across the wider London, London area. Um, and that's really, really active. It's almost, you can't keep track of it. If, if I only had time to go to all the events the Africa Center for African Studies is doing, it, you know, it would be really wonderful, but there's something, you know, term time, at least once a week, if not more than that, you know, there's talks, seminars, people coming together, some very specialized and local, some sort of high profile type stuff. We also work with the Royal Africa Society, which is an independent charity, but they are very closely linked to SOAS as well. Um, and they, they do very high profile things. Um, and, then, and then, yes, I think certainly there's assistant ongoing research, certainly get involved in research, there's projects. I think if that's something you're interested in, there's always a opportunity to get in, you know, involved in running events or you know, to, to workshops, go and present your own thinking maybe if you have something which you think that might be interesting to share and in, interact with researchers. Um, and then certainly, I'm, you know, even from us at certain for PhD students, we have quite a, and we're, we're actually work on that as we speak, but we have a system in place and we make it even better for PhD students to get involved as research assistants in ongoing research projects in, in SOAS. And to, to make that to make the administrative side of that easy at the moment it's a bit of a lots of paper form filling process which is a bit discouraging and um, so that should be much much better next september and you know we can it's mainly for phd students but i think we can also then look at master students as well it's not meant to be exclusive uh sorry how's our euro by yes either will one of both be able 20 22 23 so that's so sorry that's the coming year i think the answer there would be no but you know what where are we with the language? So what, what we are doing now is, you know, we're, we're, we are looking at partnering with African universities um, and, and making these really meaningful sort of like uh, partnerships. And so we're now to, okay, talking with okay, University of Ibadan, which is where um, uh, Wale Soyinka and, and um, King Things Fall Apart, what's his name? <laughs> Sorry. Um, Chino Achebe. Chino Achebe, thank you. My mind is um, <laughs> going to many meetings. And Chino Achebe went. Mm -hmm. And um, so from 2023, we will be having, um, we're planning to, to, to have classes with uh, Ibadan, with uh, sort of like in terms of Yoruba. And also with Hausa, we have a new, um, um, I'm a colleague joining us in September, but we will have Hausa from the following year as well. So 2023 will be very exciting for, for West African languages. Uh, right now we have uh, Somali, Swahili, Zulu, Amharic, so it's more Eastern and Southern Africa, but from 2023 it would also be West Africa as well. Um, I, th you know, I think, I mean, historically we've been very, very strong in West Africa, but I think we're going through a bit of a you know, process of rejuvenation, if you like. Right. Lots of people have retired, left, and, and have retired and, and left. Yeah. Um, so we are building that up again. But but I think for next year we probably won't be able to offer. But you know, for for the following is for twenty September twenty three entry. Yes, and um, that should be better. I'm Stuart. I'm I'm really sorry about that. Um, you know, I mean, one way of going around that, I'm sure, is is is, is go part time. Um, so if you want, don't want to delay, you want to start with the MA in 2022, yeah. but you really want the West African language, which I'm 100% sympathetic to, and I think it's absolutely important. Um, that would be you do you front load the non-language part and then start the language part in, in the second year. That might be one way around it. Yes. Um, but it's just unfortunate that for, for different reasons, we ended up not having even one of them um, this the coming year. Yes, this year. Um, I was going to say, um, and like, um, we are still uh, sort of like um, accepting uh, applications, Elizabeth. Yes. So if you if you want to apply for September, please do apply. Although the applications have closed, 
But if you, you do send an application, it is sent to both of us and we, we're okay reviewing them. So please apply, like if you want to do it by this weekend, please do. Mm -mm. Uh, and with the Ahmadu Bello, no, no, we are we are working with uh, with Ka with Kano. Kano, um, but uh, but I mean I mean Kano used to be a you know a, a, you know what is it a, a, li a little college under Ahmadu Bello, and then they became independent. Um, so I if I don't know quite again just by personal connections and you know we ended ended up having closer links there. Um, but again, with the new colleague coming, Carmen, she is called, with Carmen coming, and she has her own links in, in northern Nigeria. She has spent lots and lots of time in, in Hausa land. So she, uh, she, I'm sure she has, I mean, we have contact with Ahmadu Bello. It's just, um, it's just for some reason or the other, the, the, the formal agreement is with Kano rather than with Zaria. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 my, my personal hopes is that the future for Hausa at Source is, is really quite bright. We, we fought a lot, we were so strong historically. And we, you know, we did like fundraising activities. We you know, did the collaboration, but it's it's difficult. It's partly, you know, partly modern languages, not just African languages. It's a bit of a difficult area at the moment across the UK. I mean, lots of university modern language departments are sort of trying to see how they, you know, how they continue with what they're doing. Um, so I think our transition is partly hit by that as well. But I, I think, I think. You know, I think we probably hit the problematic area and we addressed whatever that was and go, go out of it stronger, hopefully. Yeah. Um, there's certainly a lot of commitment to Africa and African studies within the institution. Um, our, our new director, you may have seen, is still newer-ish, um, Adam <laughs> Habib, he is, he is from South Africa. So he was the, um, the vice chancellor of the University of the Witzwatersrand in Johannesburg before joining SOAS. And he, he has a very strong decolonizing, giving back to the continent, Africa-focused agenda. Yeah. Um, so again, I think we can piggyback on that and the links which we established at the at source overall, then get the get the languages in there as well. Um, it's, so it's it's Bio, it's Bayero University. Can it be okay? That's our our main main partner at the moment. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we can probably wrap it up there if that's okay with everyone. Um, thank you again for our academics for joining us today and for delivering that really interesting session, um, and also to our participants for joining us. Um, we hope to, to be welcoming you to SOAS very soon. Um, and please continue to keep checking your emails from SOAS, as like I said, there's a few things coming up um, so we can make sure to, to let you know about them. But uh, wishing you all an enjoyable rest of the day and um, take care. <laughs>